All right, in this video, we're going to be learning more uh, Ethereum smart contract based uh, exploits here, some vulnerabilities, how to exploit them, and things like that. Now, in the last one, it's, it's been a while since I made one of these. In the last one, we did cover the what was it called? The reentrancy attack, right? And that's something that I do plan on creating a POC for. I actually have that in the works right now where I have some code that I put together. I'm deploying it to the Ropsten testnet. And uh, I'm going to show you a POC of how you can, you know, what a vulnerable contract looks like for a reentrancy attack and actually writing a contract to exploit that, kind of like they did in the example that I went through uh, in the last video like this, but I'm just going to keep moving down the line for now. We're going to get an overview of the different really common vulnerabilities that we see in smart contracts today out there. This one I know has been a pretty historic one as well, a pretty prevalent one. That's the arithmetic overflow and underflow, right? And this honestly, in my opinion, this is what it really means. The true spirit of a hacker here, just the way that, you know, how, how we get creative with things sometimes, right? So the Ethereum virtual machine specifies fixed size data types for integers. And that's not any surprise, right? Pretty much all languages, whether they tell you explicitly uh, or not, where it's hidden in the documentation somewhere, almost every data type, I mean, every data type has, you know, a limit, you know, some kind of bounds, right? And, uh, Basically, what that means is an integer variable only has a certain range of numbers it can represent, right? So, in Solidity, there's something called uint8, which can only store numbers in range 0 to 255. So, if you guys are familiar with C or C++, it also had a lot of uh, integer-based data types like this that, uh, you know, you would say, like, hey, this is a 256-bit or byte integer or whatever, right? So, there's also the 256 so if you try to store 256 into uint8, it will result in zero. So this is just interesting behavior on behalf of you know, how, how this stuff is working under the hood, right? So if care is not taken, variables and solidity can be exploited if user input is unchecked and calculations are performed which result in numbers that lie outside the range of the data type that stores them. Now this is pretty much... You know, it goes along with everything else vulnerability related when it comes to code, right? It almost always stems from the lack of, you know, validating the inputs properly. So this is no different. So basically, this attack is the result of not properly checking the numbers and you can actually overflow or underflow them to actually produce numbers that you shouldn't have, right? Right. So we'll, we'll get more in depth in this as we go down this here. So the vulnerability, right? It requires a fixed size variable to store a number or piece of data that is outside the range, you know, of the expected data type, right? So if you subtract one from uint eight, so remember uint, what uint means is unsigned integer. All that means is it doesn't have a sign, a positive or negative assign associated with it. So for all intents and purposes, it's like always a positive number. So if you basically subtract a number for it, rather than becoming negative, because an unsigned integer can never be negative, it can only be positive, right? Uh, it, it will instead result in 255, right? The very top of its value, okay? So that is something important to note there, most certainly. And I think the reason 255 is because of binary, right? I think if you have eight, eight zeros, that would be 255, or sorry, if you had eight ones, like in binary, I think that is 255, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, it wraps around, basically. That's what you need to know. Instead of going to a negative number, because it can never be negative, it wraps around to the highest number. So this, obviously, this could have some very interesting consequences on a program when you give it data like that, that uh, it's not expecting so you could actually maybe circumvent certain things. It really depends on the logic of the code, what's happening in the code. But you can, you know, perhaps really do some devastating stuff with this. Oh, yeah, they answered my question for me. It's 2 to the 8th power, right? It's 256. So it will leave the variable unchanged as we have wrapped. You basically wrapped the entire length. And then they give you a mathematician example here. I'm not going to bore you guys with that, right? But uh, say for clarity, adding 257 to UN8, 
It currently has a value of zero result in the number one, right? Because it's basically just looping around from zero to 255. So a total of 256 numbers, you know, if you consider zero as an entry, right? It's from zero to 255. So after 255, it goes back to zero and then one, two, and so on, right? So yeah, think of it as being cyclic is what it's saying. So, okay, that, that checks out logically, right? Now let's look, look at some code involving this, right? This is a contract called time lock, not solidity here. Time lock is a contract. And they're defining some mappings here. So if you're, I know a lot of you guys are familiar with Python. Basically in Python, we have dictionaries. In Solidity, we just refer to it as a mapping. And so we're mapping a data type of address to, um, as the key, like the key is gonna be an address and the value is gonna be a uint. And so this first mapping is called balances and the second one is called lock time. And now we have a function here uh, there's a public function, right? And uh, it's called deposit. And what it does is this message.sender, this is a special variable here, which is the address of the sender. And so it's going to take the balance of the sender and it's going to increment the value from the message, right? And then with the lock time, so basically we're going to build out this this mapping here. And then with the lock time uh, message.sender, it's going to append, or actually it's going to set, yeah, it's basically going to append now plus one weeks. Okay, let's see. And then we have another function here, increase lock time. You went seconds to increase. And you're appending the seconds to increase. And then a withdraw function. So it's requiring that you have something in your balance, right? As the sender, right? You have to have something available to withdraw, right? And requiring that now is greater than the lock time, right? Because if you're, lock, I guess if it's, I'm not exactly sure what the lock time thing is, but I guess if you're out of time, then you can't either. Would be my guess. And the message sender transfer. So then you're going to initiate the transfer, basically the withdrawal, right? And then you're going to assign zero to the balance. So, okay, it's acting like a time vault. Users can deposit Ether into the contract. It'll be locked there for at least a week. Okay, so that's what the time lock is. So it's basically locked there for a certain period of time. I guess about a week. The user may extend the time longer than one week if they choose, but once deposited, the user... Uh, can be sure their entire ether is locked in safely for at least a week or can they here's where the vulnerability comes in right so in the event that a user is forced to hand over their private key you know, if you think of a hostage situation a contract such as this may be handy ensure to ensure that ether is unobtainable for short periods of time if a user had locked in a hundred ether and by the way guys ether is just the uh, a way of saying like the ethereum cryptocurrency right just like bitcoin we call it bitcoin with Ethereum, we call it Ether, right? So it's just Ethereum, basically. And uh, so, yeah, if a user locked in 100 Ether in this contract and handed their keys over to an attacker, an attacker could use an overflow to receive the Ether regardless of the lock time. Okay. So the attacker could determine the current lock time for the address they now hold the key for. It's public variable. Let's call this user lock time. They could then call the increase lock time function and pass an argument two to the 256 user lock time. This would be added to the current user lock time and cause an overflow resetting lock time message.sender to zero. The attacker could simply call the withdrawal function and obtain their reward. So we're using the, <clears throat> what we just saw earlier, the integer overflow to wrap over to uh, a value of zero on the lock time. So basically negating any lock time that might have been there, right? So if we if we go here, right? Determine the current lock time for the address they hold, user lock time. So basically for this, I guess that they would be writing um, some solidity code to a little solidity contract to exploit this contract. 
And basically what they would do is just, because these are public functions, you can actually call these from another contract. So you can create a malicious contract that actually can call these functions. That's what public means in Solidity, right? They're publicly accessible. So, so long as you have the address of, you know, the, the victim, right? So basically, if you do that, you can create uh, an exploit that will just uh, overflow the uh, the lock time, and it'll wrap around to zero. So basically, there is no lock time, and the funds are unlocked, and then they can withdraw it. So this is kind of assuming already in the, in this specific scenario, it's assuming that they already have the address. Uh, the, the private key, right? The private key of the, um, not the address, but the actual private key of the victim there, the attacker in the hostage situation, they got it. But obviously it doesn't rely on just that. Like this, this integer overflow can apply to anything in code, anything in Solidity code. So there's other areas where this has led to, you know, takeover of people's accounts, people losing money and stuff like that. All kinds of crazy things. Like I said, it really depends on what the logic is in the code, what's happening in the code. In this specific example, yeah, he needed the private key to be able to do this, but then he could remove the lockout. But there's a lot of use cases for this. It really depends on what's happening in the code is what I'm trying to drive home here. And then, yeah, they basically give us another one here. Um... But the traditional way to, uh, to prevent against this is to build mathematical libraries, which place standard math operators. And addition, subtraction, multiplication, division is excluded as it doesn't cause over or underflows and the EVM throws on division by zero. So there's certain things it will throw on. But uh, yeah, there's this uh, one company here, Open Zeppelin. They have some pretty good resources when it comes to developing smart contracts and stuff. <clears throat> but apparently they have some recommendations here. Some libraries they can use. A safe math library. I guess that can help. Uh, basically, I'm guessing that in that library, it's doing some kind of checking for you, which is, that's a really elegant solution, really, because you don't want to leave it up to the developers, right? That's how things get missed. I mean, you could be the best developer and know about this stuff, but then just forget to count for every possible input in one situation and that leads to a hack and then your project gets destroyed because of that, right? So if you can defer it to a library to do it for you, that's always a better solution. So you, now here is now here's more the mitigation part. It's showing you how it's actually, how you can actually use the safe math library in your contract. This is more for if you're developing, like on the developer side for mitigating it and things like that. Here's actually a real world example, which is interesting. There's a CVE associated with it and everything. Isn't that pretty neat? Um, integer overflow and a batch transfer function of a smart contract for beauty ecosystem coin. <laughs> Never heard of that. It must be like a trash coin, <laughs> I would think. Hopefully, I didn't offend anyone out there that's into this coin, but it uh, does not sound very good. And, I mean, yeah, obviously, if this is exploited on a, on a coin, it can completely destroy any any value that coin might have accrued, right? Like, people will dump in a heartbeat. Allows attackers to accomplish an unauthorized, oh, nice, increase of digital assets by providing two receivers' arguments in conjunction with a large value argument. So basically, they were able to steal funds out of this. So, yeah, probably this thing died. I'm I'm actually kind of curious about this. If I if I Google this, like, what do I find? I wonder if I can find it on TradingView or something. If there's any charts for it, or maybe on Coin Market Cap. Let's see. I think this is something different here. Let's see. Uh, I was looking at Coin Market Cap. I would be interested to see what the chart looks like for this thing. Here we go. Coin Codex. I'm not sure what this site's going to look like. As long as it gives me a price chart, I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, all. Yeah, here we go. Look, look, this is what happened, right? So this thing was, you know, it was chugging along. I mean, it was never worth a ton of money, 
but I'm guessing the hack probably happened somewhere around around here. When was this? This was 2018. Do we know the exact date on this? Okay, published on uh, April 23rd, 2018. I mean, it, it actually carried on for a little bit, surprisingly. A lot of times the hacks are the death of these coins, right? So interesting that the the hack came out here. Wait, where was it? 2018. We can't even go back that far. That's interesting. So, okay, yeah, we can't really see what it looked like before the hack. I mean, it could very well be that the price was a lot higher before that. But this chart doesn't go back that far. If I can find it on CoinMarketCap... I just think that'd be interesting. I know I'm getting a little distracted here, but it's cool to see real world examples of, of this stuff and how it affects the actual market, right? I think this is a different BEC here. I don't think this is the same thing. Yeah. But yeah, it, it must've been a very small coin to begin with. It probably wasn't very, uh, very popular. I mean, now it's completely dead as you see here. So, yeah, just an interesting thing to be able to see a real-world example, right? And so, yeah, that's pretty much all I had for this one. Another thing is uh, some developers opted to implement a batch transfer function into some ERC-20 token contracts. And the implementation of that actually contained an overflow. So that's bad if they're reusing code that's vulnerable to this attack. That's certainly terrible. So, but yeah, this is a new frontier, right? A lot of these people developing this stuff do not know what the vulnerabilities are and what, you know, they don't have that security background that you have. So if you understand the security side, all you have to do is learn a little bit of coding side uh, of like when it comes to the smart contracts, which isn't too much different from, you know, the traditional coding that you might be used to. Uh, you could provide a ton of value in the space and really position yourself for the future. So hopefully this video was of help and it was interesting to you guys. I'm certainly very interested by this stuff and we're going to be going more technical on this stuff in the future. So don't worry if that's a concern. We're just getting a bit of an overview for right now. I have some stuff in the works, like I said. So yeah, be sure to like the video, subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you guys uh, over in some of those other videos, if you want to check out the last one we did on the reentrancy attack, we're just doing a bit of an overview, kind of like we did here, but on that one. Very interesting attack, by the way. So go check that out if you haven't already. I'll see you guys right over there. Thanks for watching.